Thanks for joining our YouTube channel. If you haven't done so already, please click that subscribe button to join our community. That way you get notified each and every week a message pops up. With that being said, we pray that this message encourages and inspires you to take one step closer to Jesus. So good morning, Arise Church. Yes. And even more, good morning, Holy Spirit. Yeah, we receive your love. Just say this prayer with me. Holy Spirit, I receive your anointing for this moment and your revelation. Make your word come alive in my spirit. Show me areas of my life that I need to be restored. Amen. And Jesus is going to answer that prayer. So, Father, I bless your people with hope. May hope reside over your people because it's hope that gives us the energy needed to do what's necessary for restoration. See, the enemy wants to steal your hope. If he's stolen your hope, you're lost, you're gone. So, Father, just bless your kids, your children with hope, hope, hope in Jesus' name. So I do, I bring you greetings and blessings from your sister church here in Branded Overflow Church. And I want to tell you something, we stand with you, Arise Church. And we stand with your lead pastors. And, and I've had the privilege and honor of knowing them about 20 years. Y'all getting old. I'm okay, but y'all getting old, that's all I got to say. And uh, I have watched them. And you know what? Uh, they live what they say they believe. Amen. They don't just talk it, they walk it. So here are two pastors you can trust. I've watched them. Some of you are newer, you're visiting here, you're saying, I need, I need a couple pastors who are the real deal. Right there, yeah. real deal. Follow them, yes. So it is a joy and a privilege to be here. And I'm excited about what God is going to do in your life to bring restoration. So one of my favorite verses in the Bible is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, which is the one verse picture of what restoration looks like. The verse says this, if anyone is in Christ, so every promise has a condition, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has made a transition in their life where they stepped off the throne and they put Jesus on the throne of their life yeah. and they became a follower and a believer and a disciple of Jesus, God said there's a promise here. So that's the condition. Here's the promise. That when you receive Jesus into your life and you make him the Savior and Lord of your life, he makes a declaration in heaven. He says over you, you are a new creation. Right then and there, in heaven, it is done. You are a new creation. And he says this, all the old things have passed. They are gone. All the guilt and the shame, the sin, everything. He says it is gone. He separates it as far as the east is from the west and throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. It is old. It's not in heaven anymore. It shouldn't be on the earth. And then he says, behold, all things become new. The disciples asked Jesus. They made this connection between Jesus' life and his anointing and his prayer life. Have you made that connection yet? See, Jesus knew how to pull heaven to the earth. And they saw that, and they wanted to know how to do that. So they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what restoration ministry is. See, it's already been declared over you. This new thing that God wants to do in your life. It's up to you to pull it down and to remove the barriers, any obstacle that's keeping you from receiving the promise of Ephesians 1.3 where God says he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, God has given you everything that you need for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. It's already there. It's been declared in heaven. It's just up to you to pull heaven to the earth. That's what prayer is. Prayer is not begging God. To operate in faith is to know what God wants in heaven and just receive it. That's all it is. We don't need to work it. We just need to come into agreement with it. We just need to hear it and then do it and walk in it. Yeah. And that's restoration. That's what God wants to do in your life. So I like to take pictures of signs. I don't know what it is, but I, I take pictures of signs wherever I go. I take my camera. I take pictures of signs. And so especially signs that have to do with restoration. So for some of you, you're not really quite sure about this restoration and do I need it? Well, here are six signs that may point to you needing restoration. This first sign uh, hits home, growing up poor. Anybody grow up poor? So you, you know exactly what I'm talking about this, right? The struggle was real, right? <laughs> Eating those juicy hamburgers with that little, that little piece of, you know, we'd cut, cut the crust, man, we'd cut the crust around, make it into a circle, but it wasn't thick enough, so we would double up the bread, you know. <laughs> Listen, poverty is one of those spider bites of life. And it has affected you in a way that you may not know. You may not have connected the wound of poverty to with the unwanted emotions or unwanted behaviors that you have today. You may have made some, some agreements, some declarations over your life as a child that's preventing you from hearing and knowing God's will and walking in it. I remember as a child thinking, you know what, when I have kids, they're not going to have to go to their friend's house to borrow a basketball when they want to play basketball. Or to go to Michael Belford's house when you want to play football. The kid up the street. I am not going to be poor. So I went to college. I was an economics major. And I'm like, I'm going to be rich. I am not going to be poor. My kids are going to have. They're not going to experience what I experience. I was serving as a deacon in my church. And the pastor and others were saying to me, you know, I think God's call is on your life. And I'm like, listen, I'm doing things for him right now. I'm good. I'm banking and I'm, I'm ministering. I, that's a good combination. Because I had associated pastors with being poor. And I don't want to be poor. But I'd made a wrong agreement because of poverty. And I could have missed the call of God on my life. Some of you are you're hoarders because of what happened. Or you, or you operate in lack or scarcity because of poverty. So you need restoration. The second sign, I was with my son Luke, who is here today, and we were, uh, we were uh, kayaking on the Estero River in Fort Myers. And uh, I saw this like tributary, and, and uh, there was like these mangroves made like this perfect tunnel and the trees, and I'm like, hi, oh, it looks adventurous. I love adventures. So I said, Luke, let's, let's go through. Let's go off the beaten path where everyone else, let's go. And then as we started, there was a, a guy, and, and uh, he, he, he had his yard right there in the corner of the river and this little like creek coming into the river. And, and he made a statement I thought was really odd. He said, uh, he said, I, I wouldn't go that way. There, there are a lot of other play, places you should go and investigate. I, I wouldn't go in that direction. Well, I've really never been one to listen well to directions. I'm just saying it. You know, I was kind of that way. So I, I just ignored it and just kept going. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, as we started getting closer to the end, and the kayak wouldn't go much longer, we came across this, this post was right in the middle of the creek. I'd turn back if I were you. And then I looked up and there was this old beat up house in the background and, and I'm thinking, uh, are dueling banjos going to start playing here pretty soon? <laughs> a, couple guys, a couple guys are going to come out with shotguns. You know, if you've seen the movie Deliverance, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They were kayaking and bad things happened. They needed deliverance after that. I needed deliverance after watching the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... All right, so some of you, you were warned, like I was warned, 
you even see the sign and you didn't turn around. So I said, look, I think we need to turn around. So we turned around and went back on the Cerro River. This next sign, we were, we were in uh, Naples. And it was at a busy intersection. It was at a red light. And, uh, I, you know, what, what do you do when you have a red light? Right, you look at your phone or you read the sign. So I read the sign and it said, uh, no right turn on red when pedestrians are present. And immediately I'm thinking the processes of the sign. If there's someone who's in such a hurry that they're going to run over pedestrians and not pay attention to them as they're trying to go right on red, they're not going to stop and read this sign. <laughs> right? I mean, they're not going to stop and read a sign with eight words on it. Some of you have been run over by someone who was in a hurry and they didn't see you and they didn't read the sign and they hurt you. And you experienced a spider bite. This next sign was uh, when I was in Asheville, Asheville, North Carolina, and I was at a one of those stores that has all these signs. I took a picture of this. Even if you fall on your face, you're still moving forward. <laughs> now, some of you, you fall on your face a lot. You have, a, <laughs> God bless you, restoration right over there. Uh, and you know, you, you've gotten worn down. You know, the, the life has tripped you up, people has tripped you, the enemy. And, and you're still down. And God's saying to you, it's time to get up. It's time for you to trust again. I've got something for you. So I just want to speak hope into you. I want to speak life into you. And I want to say in Jesus' name, get up. Yes. Don't let that wound keep you down. Amen. This next sign, I was taking my wife out to, uh, to lunch at the Landings restaurant on Lithia Pinecrest Road, uh, right near uh, River Hills. And, you know, I just, you know, did what you do at a restroom, you know, a men's room. And, and I was washing my hands, and I, and I looked up at this sign. And uh, we appreciate your business. But not the jerks who continue to vandalize and steal our signs off the walls. We have cameras. And I stopped reading from there. <laughs> I, started, I started looking up, where are the cameras, you know? And then I read the rest of the sign uh, outside, you know. <laughs> Wouldn't you say that person has been wounded? Yeah. They, they need restoration? Because something of value was stolen from them. You know what? Something of value was stolen from you. And last night as I was praying and just praying for you, I heard the Holy Spirit say, some of, some of you, your virginity was stolen from you. And you're having a hard time getting over it. So I don't know who you are, but the Holy Spirit says, you know what? I can restore that too. I can restore purity. I can restore those memories. I can restore your sexuality. I can restore the love life that you have with your, with your, with your partner, with your spouse. So in Jesus' name, receive that. So this person, obviously he wrote that sign. It hasn't been restored, right? You can kind of tell, right? They're jerks, you know. <laughs> anyway, it's still there, by the way. I went there a couple weeks ago. They haven't, but, you know, they, they may have taken it down because I've, preached this message similar to Overflow Church and referred to that sign. So some of them may have told them and they've taken the sign down. At the, but it was there just a couple weeks ago at the landings. Uh, this last sign, I was at Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming and one of the most beautiful vistas I've ever seen. Uh, just a huge waterfall coming into this canyon and it was just gorgeous. And, and so I'm, I'm looking down at this sign and it said, still venting. After all these years, I thought about a lot of people who are still venting after all these years, right? They had this explosion like a volcano, at the top, but they're still venting. They haven't allowed God to go in and heal that hurt. God wants to do that in your life today. So can you just believe God for that for you today? That you're here, as Pastor Brent said, not by accident, but by appointment, because God is here. He heard your prayers. And some of you have been saying, God, I've been praying that you take this depression away, this anxiety, this fear, this, incur this insecurity, this control, this addiction to, to pornography or whatever it is, the behavior. You say, God, take it away, take it away. And God says, well, the old has to go first. There's some old agreements, some old mindsets, some old strongholds with family. They need to go so that the new can come. So God's heard your prayers. You're here today, and he wants to restore you.
in Jesus' name. So the restoration manual, which uh, hopefully you received it uh, when you came in, it's based on four truths. Now, truth is a truth that would apply to all people, uh, all nations, uh, all cultures, from the beginning of time until now. So from Adam and Eve until now, a truth is a truth for everyone everywhere. The first truth that this restoration manual is based on is truth number one, everyone has been wounded. Everyone has had spider bites. Everyone in some way has experienced neglect, abuse, trauma, self-inflicted spider bites, sins, what we call it. Everyone has. Therefore, everyone needs to be restored because everyone has been wounded Everyone wants to be restored. Truth number two. Wounds often cause unwanted emotions and unwanted behaviors leading to strongholds. Not always, often. When they're not dealt with. When, when these wounds aren't dealt with, they will lead to unwanted emotions. The wounds from your past whether through neglect or abuse, trauma, or your own self-inflicted sin, whatever it is, if you have not dealt with them, if you have not allowed God to deal with them, they will cause unwanted emotions. They will cause anxiety, panic attacks, fear, insecurity, sadness, grief, deep depression, because it, our soul can't handle it. And then when, our, when our, our emotions and our soul has been hurt in such a way and we're in pain, then you have these, these behaviors, these unwanted behaviors that are trying to deal with the pain. And so that's where these addictions come in. And I'm not talking about just addictions to drugs and alcohol and sex and pornography. I'm talking about addictions to food, to Facebook. To work, I had a major addiction to work. I, had to, I was work all the time. And I understand now it's because I didn't want to slow down long enough to feel the pain of my childhood. I just didn't want to. I didn't want to. I didn't know it unconsciously. It wasn't like I thought it. But I just worked all the time. So I was addicted to work. I was, I was dealing with these unwanted emotions with an unwanted behavior. So truth number two. Wounds often cause unwanted emotions and unwanted behaviors leading to strongholds. Truth number three is the good news. It's the gospel. God wants everyone healed. I know that you have a sozo ministry. That word sozo, it is translated saved. It's also in the New Testament translated healed, translated delivered, restored. That's sozo is to take what has been wounded, what has been hurt, and to restore it as God had intended. That's sozo. God wants to do that in your life. That's truth number three. Yeah. How do I know that? Reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I see that everyone who came to Jesus received what they needed from Jesus. No one left disappointed. If they needed healing for the body, they received it. If they needed healing for their soul, if they needed deliverance, whatever it was, every single person who came to Jesus left changed. And the Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Jesus hasn't changed. We know Jesus is right now at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. And he's not like hearing your prayers thinking, well, you know, when, when I worked the earth, I was, when I was walked the earth, that was a different dispensation. We're, we're in a different, we're, we're in a different, a different dispensation. So I can't, I can't do that anymore. No, Jesus hasn't changed. He, whatever you read in the gospels, he wants to do that for you. That's right. yeah. If you're not receiving what you read in the gospels, it's because there is something blocking your ability to receive what heaven is pouring down. And you need to remove whatever that is, those old things. You remove the old things, maybe those wrong agreements, maybe those generational strongholds, maybe the sin that's in your life. 
and you've repented from them, but maybe you haven't forgiven yourself and you still have regret. Whatever it is, you remove those things, God's blessing will pour. But I don't want you to think that God's holding out on you, that God just wants to bless Pastor Brent, Pastor Ada. Yeah. He has favorites. He's not, he has no favorites. They've just learned how to receive the outpouring of God, the overflow of God. Yeah. Truth number four. Everyone needs someone to help them through the process of restoration. Everyone needs someone. This restoration manual will bring tremendous freedom in your life. But there'll be certain things that you just won't see because you, you can't see what you can't see and you don't know what you don't know. And the danger of deception is you don't know it. So there are certain things where you're going to need someone to come alongside you and to help you through the process of restoration. I want to be that person for you today. I want to help you through the process of restoration by taking you through the steps. Step number one is to help you to recognize the connection between the spider bite, the wound from your past, the resulting unwanted emotion because the wound wasn't dealt with by the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus, so it festered, it got infected. So therefore there was an unwanted emotion. And then this unwanted emotion has caused this unwanted behavior that, that you have shame and, and regret and you're trying to control it. And it works for a little while and then it doesn't. It works for a little while. Wouldn't it be nice if it was just gone? It's just gone. I'm going to tell you something. I had emotions and behaviors that I had to Christianize. You know what I'm talking about? And they're gone. They're just not there anymore. That's what God wants for you. So step number one is the prognosis. So if you have a problem, you go to the doctor. The doctor is going to say, okay, he's going to ask you some questions. So what was going on in your life? How did this happen? So he's going to try to connect the dots, the, the wound, uh, the, the maybe the unwanted emotion if you're depressed, and the result of that, in this case, unwanted behavior. That's the difficult part. So in, in the restoration manual, I would encourage you, first of all, just, just read over it. Don't, don't do the homework at first, because you've got to see where, where it's taken you. Just read over it, because it will give you the incentive to do what's necessary in the homework. So the first part, step one, is the hard part, and that is connecting the spider bites from your past, the woundedness of your past, with the unwanted emotions, the anxiety, the depression, the fear, the insecurity, the jealousy, whatever, whatever the emotions are that aren't joy and peace and love, the, the, the emotions of the Holy Spirit. And you know you can't have fear and faith at the same time, right? So I say, oh God, give me faith, give me faith. Well, God says, you got to get rid of the fear first. And that's how it is with, God, I don't want to be depressed. I want your joy. But you got to get rid of the depression. You got to get rid of, so, so God's a God of order. You have to remove the old so the new can come. So, so the, progno, the, the prognosis is necessary for the diagnosis. That's step two. Because if the problem is you, if it's a self-inflicted spider bite, then you need to repent and to repent means to change your mind about what you did at one time. You thought this was the best way. You thought your way was the right way. And to repent and say, oh God, I was wrong. Your way is the right way. I'm trusting you. It's a turnaround of your life. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, God's best, God's standard for your life. We've fallen short by going our own way. And so... If it's what you did, th then you're, you're the solution. You need to go humbly to the cross and ask for forgiveness. And while you're there, forgive yourself. Amen? Amen. If God forgives you, then you can know, go ahead and forgive yourself too. So going through step one, the prognosis will, will, will help you understand the diagnosis. So if it's, the, if it's the enemy, you can repent all you want. The enemy ain't going anywhere. If it's the enemy that's caused that wound, then you need to resist, reject, renounce, and repudiate. You need to understand spiritual warfare. 
I think it's the most neglected doctrine in the church. We call it deliverance, whatever you want to call it, spiritual warfare. Understanding how to get the devil out of your life, off of your back, stop him from stealing from you. Right in John 10, 10, Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and you need to stop him. And the enemy can only do what he's allowed to do. So whatever the enemy is doing to you, that's all he has on you. In John 17, Jesus said, the God of this world is coming, but he has no hold on me. He has nothing on me. He can't touch me. I'm going to the cross on my own. The enemy's not driving me there. That's where we all need to be, where the enemy can't touch you. He has nothing on you. So whatever, whatever is happening to you right now, that's all the enemy has on you. But wouldn't it be wonderful that the enemy has nothing on you? You just repudiate him and say, no, enemy, you, you cannot steal from me. You, you have nothing on me, enemy. I rebuke you. I tell you to go in Jesus' name. But if he has something on you, he ain't going to go. If you have unforgiveness in your heart towards someone, or you have unconfessed sin, or if there's generational strongholds that need to be broken, he goes, you can tell me to go all you want, but I'm staying. So we have to understand the processes. This message isn't about deliverance and spiritual warfare, but it's in the manual. The third source of our woundedness that we need to recognize in knowing what to do is neglect. So there's my choices, there's the enemy, and then there's neglect. Now abuse is what's done to you. Neglect is what was not done for you that should have been by your parents especially, and as a child. And as I've been doing this ministry now for 20 years, I have found that most people have the greatest struggle with the area of neglect, of what their parents didn't do for them, because they focused all the things that the parents did, did right, but these things that were neglected, that they didn't even know, because you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what was missing from your childhood that should have been there, that's caused unwanted emotions and unwanted behaviors in your life. Physical neglect is the lack of provision, the lack of protection. So if you were a child that had to fend for yourself, feed yourself, fight for yourself, you were bullies, that was me. My father died when I was seven, before that, he had a brain tumor, so for most of the time he was in the hospital, he had three serious operations. My mother had a 10th grade education. We were poor, she was working. She was a young mother. So, man, there was a lot of neglect. I just wasn't covered, I wasn't protected. I was trying to protect myself. I was being bullied. I had second grade, I had a kid take a knife to my throat and st stole my lunch money. Back then it was, I think, 15 cents or whatever. You know, I never brought money with me again. Just, just that neglect caused tremendous woundedness in my life. And out of that came this need to control my environment. So I became a control freak. Yeah. And there was fear and insecurity. So I had to create this bravado that I'm not afraid. Which created this need for competition that I had to win. I had to beat you to show you I'm not afraid. I'm not insecure. So physical neglect, emotional neglect. Emotional, ne emotional neglect is the lack of nurturing. It's a lack of affection. Hugs, it's a lack of love. It's a lack of being told by your parents, I love you. You're important, you're a part of this family, you belong, you have significance. It's, it's where we learn how to trust and emotionally connect with others. It's from our parents, especially our mothers who nurture us and nurture that, those social skills that we need. So I had an angry, depressed mother. And I wasn't given those emotional skills, so I got married at 21. 
and, and my wife doesn't want to be married to me anymore. I'm like, man, I'm the best. What's wrong with, what's wrong with you, man? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not beating you. I'm not doing drugs, because I was saved this time. I'm not doing drugs. I'm not cussing you out. I'm not going out and messing around. All the things I grow up, like, man, I'm the best. What's wrong with you? And she goes, you're defining our marriage by what you're not doing? She goes, I want your heart. I want you to love me. You're, you're a dutiful man. You do the right things, but where's your heart? She had no emotions. I didn't know how to love her emotionally because emotions were, were for us, they were all bad. They were all, so I just put my emotional spectrum like this, real small, it was narrow. I had to learn how, I had to have my wife teach me how to love her how to open up my spectrum, to emotionally love her, to connect with her heart. Some of you have unhealthy relationships. You have a new BFF every six months, right? Best friend forever, right? It's Facebook, new best friend forever, yeah. Next month, six months. <laughs> or you have struggle with dating relationships. You have a lot of short relationships. Maybe you struggle with divorce. That, that all probably goes back to emotional neglect, probably some with emotional abuse, which if we have time, we'll talk about that. Then there's mental abuse or mental neglect. By the way, each of these also have an abuse side too. It's what is done to you. I'm really focusing on the neglect because they're, they're the ones that are hardest to see because we don't know we don't know. We, when, you're, when you're brought up in a child, all you know is your childhood. You don't know what wasn't given to you. So it was my wife, Robin, who really helped me. And she's the one who wrote the restoration manual. She was here in the first service. And, and um, you know, I, I rewrote it, put the four truths in there and four steps in there because I needed something simple because I'm a simple person. You know, she's a, she's a five-fold teacher. And I was like, okay, I need something simple. So I simplified it, but all the information is, is her. And she's, she's taught this to me. And I am who I am today as a man of God, as a husband, as a father, and as a pastor because of her leading me through this restoration. Amen. So mental neglect. Mental neglect is the lack of encouragement, the, the lack of confidence that a father especially places into a child that allows you as a child to fail in trying to find your way, right? Proverbs, I think it's 23.8, train up a child in the way that they should go so that they, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Well, for that child to find the way they should go, they're gonna have to fail sometimes. And you need a father who's gonna say, that's okay, get up. So I, I didn't let my, my kids quit. I'd say, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to try this and you're going to finish it. So I would have all my kids take a year of piano because I thought, my thoughts were, you know what, my child, I didn't have piano. Um, you know, I wasn't encouraged to play in, in organized sports, so I loved them. So uh, school wasn't, a, so I decided I'm going to just, everything that was neglected, I'm going to make sure my kids have. We, we homeschooled them until high school. All four of them graduated from Newsom High School. So we had this, this, this thought, we're, we're going to have an education that's going to address the spiritual. We're going to address the arts, because arts is prophetic. The music, the drama, the dance, and the prophetic is what brings the voice of God to the earth. Amen. So I wanted them to find their, their area of arts that, that God was calling them to. So they all took piano. Two of them said, that's enough, but I made them finish the year. One of them became a drummer. Oh, my God. <laughs> he's just now bought his house. Uh, he's marrying uh, Sierra Spiker, the daughter of, of the pastor of South Bay, David Spiker, a good friend of mine. He, and I, I applauded when he took his drums. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, thank you. That was the way that he should go, but couldn't there have been another way? Oh, all the drumming. My other, other son didn't like but he liked guitar. Two of them are very good keyboardists, but that was the way that they should go. Academically, 
You know, my one son struggled with math. My other son was a genius in math. And I say, you know what? That's okay. Just, you're not going to be an engineer. Two of my sons are engineers. One is a marketing. The one who's here now, Luke, and he's doing very well in his profession because he's a people person. He's like his mom. Everybody loves him. Everybody trusts him. He's got a shepherd's heart. And man, that's the kind of marketer you want, right? That's the kind of salesperson you want. Someone who trusts you immediately. You don't have to know math to do that. So I told him that. You don't have to be like your younger brother who's this genius in math. Just be you. See, it's giving our children the confidence, encouraging them so that they'll succeed. It's okay if I brag on my kids a little bit. So all four of my sons have graduated from college. You got two engineers, a nurse, and the one I just mentioned has MBA in marketing. They all have their own homes. They have wives that love the Lord. Wives that some wives are still coming, you know. That, that, I didn't have that as a father. That's what, what the, the role of a father. I think about wow, how different my life would have been if I had had a father. That would have been encouraging me, speaking life into me. And then spiritual neglect. Just a father that would have blessed me. So I have four sons. The first time that doctor gave that son to me, I immediately blessed him. And I received him as a gift from heaven, right from the very beginning. Each of my sons, Luke, Matthew, Aaron, and Joshua, I receive you as a gift from heaven. I cover the anointing of God on your life, his call and his purposes, his destiny for you. I cover it right now with the blood of Jesus. I speak life to your wife. I cover her in the blood of Jesus. Keep her pure, Lord. Prepare her for my son that the two of them together will be stronger than they would be apart. We homeschooled our kids, as I said, until high school. Except for two years, my wife went back to Brandon. She's a nurse, went back to Brandon Hospital, worked in the emergency room. So I would take my kids to school, and I watch all, all the parents just drop their kids off. And I'm like, no, we're not doing that. We went to the parking lot. I put my hand over each of my kids' heads, and I blessed them. And I released God's blessing into the life. I'm thinking, wow, how different my life would have been. I had so many strongholds, struggled with pornography and lust, all these things that I was using to help with these unwanted emotions because of wounds. The spiritual blessing of a father and mother who like Brent and Ada, who doesn't just talk it, but who walks it. Our kids don't just need to hear what's right and what's wrong. They need to see it in our lives. So, so the, the person that my sons saw preach to them every Sunday was the same dad that they saw in their home. There was no difference. They didn't hear him pray any different in church as when he was at home praying over them. Blessings and favor, anointing, freedom. For you, maybe you didn't have that in your home. But I want to tell you something. Your father can do that right now in your life. He can give you all that was lost because he's done it in my life. All that your father and mother didn't release into you, the blessing, the spiritual blessing, all the things that happened because there was neglect physically, the emotional, he can restore that all. He is a good God. The last error of neglect that causes so much woundedness is the neglect of our children's sexuality not protecting their sexuality, their purity, their virginity. How can we expect a child, even a teenager, to know what's really out there, to know the predators are out there, the users that are out there that want to use our kids for their bodies? So my parents had no clue what was happening to me. The president of the boys' club, I played baseball, tried to molest me. A friend of the family who, who I was called, was called uncle tried to molest me. Two older cousins. So I, I said, Lord, I'm going to do all that I can that my four sons aren't going to have to go through that. They're not going to have their minds perverted and polluted, being exposed to pornography early on. I had it in my own home. I had friends. It wasn't on the internet where it is today. But that perverted how I would see women 
as objects of my affection rather than those who are created in the image of God as co-heirs with Jesus Christ. So right away it was distorted and polluted, right as a little child. So we, we need to cover our children's sexuality, the neglect of their sex. We can't just, just hope it turns out well for them. Right. The enemy has a scheme for them. Yeah. And so does the world. Right. Well, th this morning I feel like a, a rocket scientist who's trying to, to tell you how we landed a uh, man on the moon, you know, a capsule on the moon. There's just so much. So the other area is abuse. W what was done to you in the same areas of physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, sexual abuse, being molested or raped, how that has affected us. And then trauma. Trauma is these devastating, sometimes horrific, events that happened to us that were outside of our control. The death of a parent. My father died when I was seven. My little brother died of, it was called crib death back then. Sid's today. He was, I was 10 years old. I had ro rocked him to sleep that night, put him in his bed. He and I shared a room. Woke up in the middle of the night watching my dad give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. He never breathed again. That had an impact on my little soul. That trauma. You need to look at those traumas. My parents divorced as adults. Divorce is trauma. Any kind of major sickness or an injury, either in sports or a car accident, that's trauma. It's affected you. It's caused these unwanted emotions, unwanted behaviors. So with neglect and abuse, the solution is we need to forgive. We need to release them to God. With trauma, we need God to come into those places, and we need to trust him in them. Can you stand with me, please? My goal this morning was that you would experience a certain level of restoration so that you would continue the process, that you would go through the manual and do what's necessary because it's worth it. See, God wants to hear your prayers. He, he doesn't want you to continue feeling these unwanted emotions of anxiety, panic, depression, whatever it is that we're medicating. That's not the abundant life that Jesus promised us. Jesus, I've come to give you life in the overflow, a depressed life, anxiety, fear, insecurity, jealousy, all those things, doubt, or these unwanted behaviors. That's not God's will for you. So Pastor Brent's going to come and close the service, and I challenge you to continue what God has done in your life today through the ministry of restoration. You have a wonderful Sozo ministry here. I've met with Ada and Carol and Lisa, so I'm excited that the message is going to carry on. So, so God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to come to Rise Church. Thank you for watching this message today. We ask that you hit the subscribe button and share this message on all social platforms. Man, we are hoping that you were encouraged and blessed by what you heard. And we cannot wait to see you next time.